Hi, I'm Paul Simon, a former United States Senator from Illinois. Not far from where I am right now, on September 15, 1858, a lawyer and former member of the Illinois legislature named Abraham Lincoln challenged Stephen A. Douglas in the fourth of their famous debates. Judge Douglas hoped to use the Jonesboro debate to convince the citizenry that Mr. Lincoln was a fervent abolitionist. Mr. Lincoln would lose the Senate race, but just two years later he became the nation's 16th president, emancipator of the slaves and defender of the Union. His name brings up powerful emotions around the world more than any American hero. He evokes intense feelings of freedom and patriotism. One hundred years later, in the small town of Lincoln, Massachusetts, two boys would grow up in the midst of another turbulent time for America. They would meet. They would discover music. They were called John. This is their story. In the glow of each other's majestic presence Daddy will sing, babe Don, 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 let's start Hey! I'm John Kerr, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen of Lincoln, Massachusetts And I now officially declare this documentary open! I don't remember me ever meeting you. Yeah, I think that I, at some point early on, I got John confused with a bunch of other students who were in the next uh, grade. You had an accident, had to go to the hospital in like sixth grade or seventh oh, grade? Oh, and, and they made everybody yeah. write cards. It was yeah, this yeah. like singularly yeah. bogus thing, but because our, our schoolmate, John, had to go to the hospital, we all had to write him letters saying like, get well soon. Right, 90% of these kids had never heard of me or met me. Yeah, I, I, so I got this giant pile of cards, which I probably threw them away, I'm sorry to say, John. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to look through Man. them and find yours. But uh, it was actually really mysterious on my end, too, because I got all these cards from people I didn't know. You know yeah, I think my card said, like, people? John Linnell, I don't know you. <laughs> I think I probably met him in the hallways of our junior high school at some point. Um, and he was like a very, you know, um, uh, you know, he, he was way more gregarious than I was. And he was kind of interested in just like, you know, talking. Like, you know, I think I was a much more shy kid. Well, you know, John is a year older than me. So it doesn't, it doesn't seem like that, you know, big a deal when you're, you know, 41 and 42 to be a year different. But in a lot of ways, our relationship is you know still kind of frozen in that way that he's always a year older than me. We had a really good friend, this guy Jimmy Mack, who turned us on to a lot of what essentially was the kind of like proto-punk music. He played us the Ramones and he played us Iggy and the Stooges and all this stuff that in 1976, 77 was really, you know, pretty much a local New York experience. You know, I think at that time, like I was already geared up to be a complete elitist snob about music, but the thing about Jimmy was he was really into the most mass market pop stuff as well. When punk rock came along and, and New Wave came along, it had the kind of the perfect balance of like song to 
uh, attitude. You know, like there was lots of top quality songs, like it was really concise, and everything really reflected people's personalities. And uh, and it was not about being slick. I mean, up until that point, I think saying that you thought you should be in a rock band was sort of like saying, I think I should be the Incredible Hulk. Tell you how to cycle a truck, then you go and turn around and break my heart, and waste my Cyclops time. I've got a Cyclops mind. There's some type of cranky New England Yankees, you know? Uh, I would say if you were trying to, like, put the sort of subspecies of people that they're in, um, they're, they're, you know, they have a pur they're Puritan elements to their, you know, components. They have, like, you know, old-fashioned New England liberal uh, um, elements. Uh, and also sort of these really boho, um, Williamsburg, you know, art, you know, Williamsburg art fuck type of, you know, tendencies, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, and I say that in a caring way. They've never really relied on being signed, per se. They, they record what they want to record, they play the songs they want to play, they tour when they want to tour, they've made unique videos that were accepted early on, uh, they've opened the doors for other alternative artists, they've They've really been the vanguard of, of alternative, and I think that their importance can't be underestimated. It was sweet, I'd let pain is sweet, but the after effect left me paralyzed. I just stare with my one glass eye, hoping you won't be back again. There's a whole. How serious a documentary is this, actually? I mean, have people been truthful or. Yeah, people have been mostly truthful. Have people pretty much said that they're nice guys, or what's the... Most people say that they're nice guys. Have you talked to anybody that really knows them? could participate in the rock and roll with They Might Be Giants, but it didn't, you didn't have to be pretending to be um, more messed up than you are. You know, you didn't have to pretend to be some Bacchanalian messed up person that um, you could just be a normal middle class driver and um, still enjoy um, songs in 4-4 time. And I always thought the perfect symbol of that was, uh, you know, how they like flipped that old Who slogan. Um, Hope I die before I get old, and they have the song, I hope that I get old before I die. Oh, it's a long, long rope they used to hang you soon, I hope, and I wonder why this hasn't happened, why, why, why? And I think about the dirt that I'll be wearing for a shirt, and I hope that I get old before I die. We want to rebel against that Bacchanalian 60s sex drug thing because that didn't really work. And, you know, uh, alcoholics sleeping with people they don't know, is it, <laughs> that isn't a really attractive movement to me. So I always, um, I always liked that about They Might Be Giants. They might be giants. They might be rain. They might be heat. They might be frying up a stalk of wheat. They might be giants, they might be brain, they might be washed, they might be Dr. Spock's backup band. Tabloid footprints in your hair, tabloid footprints everywhere. We can't be silent because they might be giants and and what are we gonna do unless they are? This is like the 20th anniversary they might be giants now, right? You guys have been around? Um, John well, we aren't the original members of the band, but, but uh, if John and John, the original guys, were here, <laughs> we have some stories to tell. We have a new album coming out as well. Have you been working on that? Uh, we've been working on a record. We're actually working on it right now. We're sort of wrapping it up. Yeah. This is the uh, sketch of It's So Loud in Here. Right. So I, Done. I uh, Done. Disco style. -y. Your friend. <laughs> Welcome to the limelight. <laughs> so it's like. 
it's always a little bit tense when we're when we're uh, playing each other stuff because you don't want to have your ego shattered. But we're you know I think we're both tough now. What are you thinking, Adam? The only thing arrangement wise is that I feel like there's a little bit of like the enough already factor by the repeat double chorus at the end. Like maybe uh -huh. either something very different has to happen in there, or else maybe just not do a double chorus or something. I suggested that. That was vetoed a while back. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not into. I mean, because of because of the bridge already having this kind of built-in modulation it could between. Could be a, a cry for help. Like yeah, I like, mean, in, right? Like, in loop, in look, loop. is this interesting? Man? Yeah, right. What about this? Right. I'm still here playing a song, man. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. I think both of us, you know, um, run the risk of being really precious about what we do. Coming up with strategies that sort of try to to get. You know, make us work more spontaneously, or uh, you know, do stuff co relatively quickly. Have always kind of worked well for us. The third phrase a little bit more different. It'll, it'll, you know, it'll give it that extra bit of what this, the lyrically or six lyrically? minor. Yeah, yeah. What I mean, if you just land on a different place. I was gonna. I mean, this isn't really for now, but like when you track the vocal, you know. You mean the the fourth time, the fourth repeat. I don't know if you skip the third one. So like this, yeah. Oh, I see. I mean, that's the, that to me is like seems like sort of the the hook of it. Yeah, no, it's great. It's good. But you want to, but you want to change it. I'm just suggesting it. Right, it's fantastic. Just, right. it's just too good. Yeah. The cringe problem. We're both super tuned into that, and we usually uh, um, do some kind of an end run, you know, some kind of a disclaimer beforehand, like. I know, I know, right. but just get over that. Imagine it better, you know. I mean, we, we, we know each other pretty well at this point, so we don't, I don't think there's any secret cringing going on. All right, we'll put that into Pro Tools, fellas. I don't think we'll have any problems. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks, that was great. I mean, we got here in 80, I guess, 81. I think we were sort of fully expecting it to be this, like, you know, glittering, you know, uh, kind of, you know, punk rock heaven. And, you know, there's just, there was just kind of nothing left. We had a whole lot of conversations about what, how we were going to do this. And I think it started with one of us wanting to get a band and the other one wanting to do some more high-tech duo thing. And then we figured out a way to do something that we both liked using just a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder playing straight through, just pressing play and going. Tape machine became making a virtue of necessity, really, that uh, it was a way to be able to let the song decide what needed to be done, not who could play what. I think that it, uh, at the outset, especially when the Giants um, tried to crash the New York rock scene, it really did seem sort of a hopeless venture. Sometimes it might be somebody like Guns N' Roses and they might be giants, and you didn't find a whole lot of crossover fans. They had some hostile audiences, certainly, you know, and they had, but I, th I think more, more difficult than a hostile audience is an apathetic audience, you know, or a small audience, that did, you know, or an audience of just five friends. Winning cells, right. thank you all for coming. Where they might be giants, this is how our show goes. Some musicians just thought they were ridiculous. You know, it was like the antithesis of musician. Hammer down, rabbit ears, hammer down. If you pass the rabbit child, say hammer down for me. The music was important, but there was a show, and it was, it was not something that you'd leave and go, how about that song? It was something you'd leave and go, what was the deal with the fence? But luckily for us, within another uh, couple of years, we kind of managed to make this lateral move into the the real East Village like performance world. Certain venues were 
making a real conscious effort to mingle theater and performance art and rock bands and you know drag queens and nudity and drunkenness and uh, substance abuse as you know a general general thing and and uh, they might be giants uh, fit perfectly in that. I mean, especially their early shows where they were using a lot of props. So they had this big stick that had a microphone attached to the bottom that they'd bang on the stage and would reverb and uh, for the song, Lie Still Little Bottle. And that would be, I think, the only accompaniment maybe to the song was this, people would be like, the stick, the stick. I did this song, and I still uh, think it's probably one of the most amazing things I've ever seen on a stage, where Linnell is playing his saxophone, Flans is doing the vocal, and that's all there is, except there's a percussion. sounded so good, so perfect. The picture was perfect. You wouldn't want to add anything else to it. It was very impressive. Playing at APC and Dorinka and the Pyramid Club, which were all these East Village kind of trendy clubs, very much in the sort of mid-80s moment, was, as a performer, I have to say, like, there was like really like some of the happiest times of my life. 8BC, for example, was sort of set up like the, the, the theater in The Little Rascals, where there's like a big handmade curtain. It was such a positive vibe you know, for the audience, too. I think everybody was really yeah. happy to go out and see a real show. There were a lot of places like that in the East Village. Um, one of them was called Dorinka, and it was a, a little room. You know, it was somebody's apartment that had been converted into a tiny club. I felt like we were the house band there. Uh, this guy named Gary Ray was the guy who, who booked it. And, you know, he was just, just doing the stuff that he liked, but it, but it actually had a scene, and there were people showing up. They'd come to see Karen Finley or um, Steve Buscemi, just people who were doing some oddball kind of performance. They had a monthly show. And like I say in the beginning, there were 10, 15 people, and they built it up. Now, our place could, now we weren't legal, but if we were legal, they'd probably say, okay, you have a capacity of 90 people or 100. Well, eventually, we got probably about 350 people into that place. And whenever they kicked into, um, that song. Don't, don't, don't let it start. Uh, I've got a weak heart, whatever the hell that song was. Whenever they kicked into that, I just, you know, this warm wave would come across my entire body and say, you're home. Don't, don't, don't let it start. This is the worst part Can't believe for all the world That you are my precious little girl But don't, don't, don't let's start I've got a weak heart Now I'm getting around I need to get around When you are alone You are the cat You are the phone You are an animal Why are them singing out? For all the world that you are my precious little girl But don't, don't, don't let's start I've got a weak heart now Get around, now you get around Everyone in the world ever gets what they want And that is beautiful
gets what they want, and that is beautiful. Everybody dies frustrated and sad, and that is beautiful. One of the really curious things about They Might Be Giant songs is um, if you just looked at a lyric sheet, you would probably think it, you know, this would be like song after song would just be some dirge, you know, because some of the lyrics are really depressing, um, like um, the lyric, Everybody dies frustrated and sad, and that is beautiful. You know, kind of a downer idea, but it's you know it's in this uh, it's beat. Everybody dies frustrated and sad, and um, so many of their songs are like that. You know, like the one you're older than you've ever been, and now you're even older, and um, now you're older still, and it, it's just like you're gonna die. But it's done. The music, the sound just comes in and cheers you up. You're older than you've ever been, and now you're even older, and now you're even older, and now you're even older. You're older than you've ever been, and now you're even older, and now you're older still. Time is marching on. is still marching on. This day will soon be at an end, and now it's even sooner, and now it's even sooner, and now it's even sooner. This day will soon be at an end, and now it's even sooner, and now it's sooner still. Because I think even the songs that might initially seem peppy, and then they actually seem to be like they're about, like I'm dead and you walk in my grave, I think, um, I think even then, if you continue with those songs, you know, I think they're actually peppy again in a sort of a, a horrible way, you know, like a really a, a dreadful, I mean in a good way, a dreadfully good, you know, good dreadful. Um, they're weird songs. Guys are so, so funny, you know. I just played her um, the song, They'll Need a Crane. And I said, well, actually, I, th I think, you know, the song is kind of sad, Tell Me Ukraine. I think it's about a divorce, and it might even be about one of the John's parents, you know. Uh, and uh, she said, that's it. They're funny, but they're sad. And uh, which at the time seemed ludicrous, but, but really is probably, probably true. As far as I'm concerned for what we do, it's not interesting just to, like, publicly cry, you know. It's, it's, it doesn't make... It's not even, it doesn't even have the effect of making me sad if somebody else is doing that. I think the thing that's really sad is when somebody represents some kind of inner sadness some other way. There's a pretty relentless thread in the text of our songs, especially in the, like the first, you know, the first 15 years of our songwriting. That's, that's, that's pretty relentlessly, uh, you, know, uh, you know, kind of earth-shatteringly dour. Or else someone's gonna get you. Someone's gonna get you. Someone's gonna get you. Hide away. Folk family. Better hide away. Better hide away. So this is, uh. This is.
this is the studio. This is my this is my one bedroom apartment that I lived in all through the 80s and 90s. And uh, it's now my workspace. This apartment is also the home of dial -Song, which is this trusty recorder call 675, which can be found. Uh, this cost two dollars. When they did dial a song, which was really basically a, a way of, of uh, filling in the gap when Linnell was injured in a bike uh, accident, he was a bike messenger and broke a small uh, bone in his, uh, in his hand and they couldn't play. Flansburg came up with dial a song as sort of a stopgap measure, just as a way of, of, of producing stuff, of still keeping their visibility. The coolest thing about it was just like, you know, we gotta write more songs. Like, yeah, no. it was often a way that we, you know, it was a way to get things done when we were kind of scratching our heads saying, well, I just wrote 10 songs. I, I don't need to write any more songs. Right. We actually, we ran this ad in the Village Voice and the, on the back of the Village Voice. That was like kind of the primary way that it was advertised. Everybody checked the bulletin board, whether it was for finding a lover or something else going on, tickets for something, who knows. The massage parlor ads cost 50 bucks and the personal ads cost 10 bucks. So I actually told them that it was just a personal it's like my personal message. I have this dial song service, and they're like, is this a business? No. Is this like promoting something? I was like, no, it's just my thing. Like, just my, it's my little trip, leave me alone. And I would pay my $10 every week, and, um, and but because of that, I was afraid to ever put a, a message that said where we were playing or who we were or anything about the band on the machine. So when you called dial song, all you heard was the song. The thing about Dallas Song, and this is still the case, is that when you call up, you're the only person. It's you and the machine. There's, no, there's only one telephone line, so the uh, tape is playing for you and you alone at that particular moment. So I, I don't know why that's, that makes it better. It also uh, really bonded you with the band, because you could hear songs that weren't out yet. You could hear songs that were in progress. You could hear fragments of songs they were, they were just working on. And um, that provided a, a real sense of intimacy with a band that you don't usually get. When I was in high school, I used to call up Dial a Song all the time, and there was a different song on there all the time. And I go, how the hell do these guys write and record a song every day? I think for a while there was changed every day, or I don't know how long it was, but every time I called, it was a different song. And sometimes it didn't work, and it would just ring off the hook, or it would be busy. And you could even, you could make 15 minutes out of your day trying to get through to Dial a Song. I knew people who depended on those on the music on those phones to prove to themselves that you could renew your life or um, like a little pillow, a musical pillow they could go to sleep with every night. Like um, kind of like sex phone or sports phone for people who need to hear a tune. And that like seemed weird to me. Yeah, I would, I would call it to cheer myself up. And I, re I remember once just being I don't remember what I was devastated about. Like looking back, I can't remember anything really bad that's ever happened to me. But um, just remember once being in tears and calling it up, and there was this song about how there's an ant crawling up my back. <laughs> I don't know why I just started laughing because it was just a silly idea of this um, insect or ants, insects, yes, insect. Um, you know, tickling your skin and. Um, you know, how bad can the world be if there's a song about that and a phone number in Brooklyn you can call to hear about it. I got my house surrounded. I know I'm in there. Come out with both my hands up and don't make me come in and get me. Don't make me come in and get me. Me, I can't hide from my mind Though I try, try, try I can't hide from my mind Though I try Hi, this is John of They Might Be Giants. You've reached They Might Be Giants dial song service. 25 hours a day, 6 days a week. That music at the end of the tunnel for the next generation. Thank you for calling. Tell your friends, we're going on tour in a couple weeks, so see us out there on the road. We'll be in Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and...
places in Florida. So uh, see you there. Bye. So I get home from work and the entire tape was filled up and I thought, all right, you know, the style of song thing's finally taken off. And um, then I, I, I rewound the tape and started listening and, and you know, there were a couple of hangups at the beginning. And then I got this call that was a, uh, obviously a, uh, like a conference call, like somebody had gotten the feature on their home phone, probably just introduced at that point, where they could conference in their friend. And it, it was this woman, Gloria, who I guess is, you know, she seemed like sort of a housebound person. What do you think, what do you make out of that recording? I don't know, Gloria, I just don't... Some kind of singing. They sound like all kinds of people, right? Yeah. And then it says another child is born in India every time you call this number, right? Yeah, right. Does that make any sense to you? No, it doesn't. But this one here, there must be giants, it's called. And it says call machine. And they get the phone number. Yeah. But what kind of money does he make? It don't make no sense. One of the weird things about recording songs for dial song over the years is we realized that anything with like long sustained notes makes it rewind. So we, we um, I think like on our first album that you can actually like tell that we were doing like short staccato songs simply so they'd work on dial song. I'm not allowed to ever come up with a single original thought. I'm not allowed to meet the criminal government agent who oppresses me. I was the best hope of my generation, destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical. I should be allowed to share my feelings. I should be allowed to feel. I should be allowed to think. And I should be allowed to blurt the merest idea if by random whim one occurs to me. But sadly, this can never be. I'm not allowed to think. Well, I was uh, invited to a Greenwich Village nightclub many, many years ago to see a friend of mine on the bill named Stan Edwards, a man who sang a tribute to Bobby Darin. And it said on the program preceding Stan Edwards was a group called They Might Be Giants. So I said to myself, oh, I'm going to be bored. And first of all, I said to myself, who could be so bold, so presumptuous to, to call themselves giants or that they might even approach being giants? What, I figured I, I've got to sit through that and suffer through that until the, the main star comes on. And uh, when they came on, it was electric. In my 43 years on TV, about 28,000 episodes of the Joe Franklin TV show, it's one of the few times that I actually physically and most uh, enthusiastically went after a guest. Yeah, I can remember seeing them on TV for the first time and they start to do, you know, appear on Letterman or whatever venue it was. Uh, and that's a... It's a very strange feeling, and, they, and I don't know if it's just because I know them, or if it's or if it's because it was really the way it was, which is the way it felt like. But they seemed really out of place and uncomfortable, and uh, and now I think I've seen them, you know, a few times more recently, getting on TV for appearances, and they they look a little bit more comfortable in in that kind of a role. I mean, we got a freaking camera phone. <laughs> Whatever. All right. Here we go. Here we go. So this is an album cover right here. So what is it? So um uh the what what key are you in? Baby, check this out. I got uh, well uh, what what uh play a C chord. Okay, I got it. Alright, I'm there. Baby, check this out. One, two, two. Baby, check this out. I've got something to say. Uh, you guys doing okay on food and drinks here? Yeah, we're really good. Although I missed the huge bowl of uh, goldfish. Uh, I think it was like the huge bowl that you was either pretzels or big I think like two times ago, ones? two times ago or something. It was like, uh, yeah, it was I a crazy amount of yeah, goldfish. Remember crazy. the goldfish? You know, normally this is something I do by myself, but it's nice to have company. You guys ready? Integrity, right? We 
That went terribly, I thought. What the hell was that? Career How'd you guys suicide. enjoy it? How many times have you been on the show? We were on the Letterman show here a lot before. Right. And then, and I, I feel like we were just sort of like, you know, the thing you inherit. With you the, have to like go like back and visit. It's like, How many appearances here have, you, you know, happened right. because you mistakenly thought you were going on Letterman? <laughs> you were like... Uh, we're here for love. Oh, that no, guy. No, no, no. I see. How many times have They Might Be Giants been on, like, Conan or Letterman or The Tonight Show now? But in 1989, a band that I liked being on The Tonight Show, this was just, you know, um, civil defense air sirens had to go off in my town, you know? And I remember uh, my friends and, and I gathering together on the couch, like, oh, a band we like is gonna be on The Tonight Show. And um, Jay Leno was hosting, and, and that was um, when Jay Leno was still really good. And uh, it was just this special occasion, and you know, I think 12 people were like hovered around the couch watching They Might Be Giants on The Tonight Show play a song with The Tonight Show band, you know, with Doc and Tommy and those guys. And it was just like the weirdest, most pleasurable thing that we had ever seen on network television. I'm very proud that we got to play with the Doc Severinsen Orchestra during the waning years of the Johnny Carson uh, Tonight Show. That was, you know, I'm glad we're, we've been around long enough for that to have been true. Make a little birdhouse in your soul, not to put too fine a point on it. Say I'm the only bee in your body. Make a little birdhouse in your soul. You can hear it in the night. Keep the watch on the bird. Make a little birdhouse in your soul. Not to put too fine a point on it. Say I'm the only bee in your body. Make a little birdhouse in your soul. You can hear it in the night. Keep the watch on the bird. Make a little birdhouse in your soul. Not to put too fine a point on it. Say I'm the only Birdhouse is, you know, just a towering achievement. That's just a great, great song. For hearing Birdhouse on the radio, you even not, without knowing what any of the lyrics were, right, use a great it song. just moved me. Right. You know, it was just, it's such a well-written song, and it, and it, the, the, the groove of it, and, and the chord structure, everything. That's a beautiful song, though. Still, how can you combine something about a nightlight um, that, to me, sounds like something? Um, a birdhouse in your soul is like an image that you can't shake after that, and it's a beautiful, beautifully written line. And the whole song is beautifully written by any standard. Um, and uh, a gorgeous melody. And, um, but then it's actually about a nightlight. That's too much for a lot of people to process, I think. And so they're like, oh, well. And then it's called Wacky, which, um, which cracks me up. There's only two songs in me, and I just wrote the third. Don't know where I got the inspiration or how I wrote the words. Spent my whole life just digging up my music's shallow grave for the two songs in me and the third one I just made. I, mean, I always thought they had great songs in live shows. The, really, the, the defining moment for me was in terms of their demos. The original tape that we put out in in 85 was kind of like, I think at one point we were thinking it's like a history of the band. We sold it ourselves at shows and stuff like that. And then finally this guy named Michael Small got a hold of a copy and reviewed it in People Magazine. People Magazine was a really incredible place to work at the time. It was like the golden years. And if I was excited about something, I could come in and we could write about it. So I came in and told Ralph Novak, who is the um, music reviews editor, that I was really excited about this. He said I could write the review even though there was no record out. And I wrote the review and just put the address where you could order the cassette. It seemed insane to me that um, a demo tape, I mean, what ostensibly was a demo tape, I mean, we didn't call it a demo tape, and we were selling it, so it was really, it was something real. But I mean, it was only real because we said it was real. There was nothing, there was nobody behind it. There was no, 
no, it was a cassette, you know, it was just the, the cheapest thing possible. And it was around that time also that, that um, people from MTV, which was then, you know, in its earliest days, became familiar with that. So I went to see them at a club called Dorinka and told them I would pay for it and I wanted to make a video out of one of their songs. And I remember Flansburg calling up John Linnell going like, I got a guy here named Adam Bernstein and he really needs to get famous. <laughs> so it was, you know, it was, it was sort of funny. I also remember he was wearing purple nail polish at the time. Not that that's concerned anything. This was like probably a month or so before that first album came out that we were getting played on MTV alongside White Snake and Whitney Houston and stuff like that. It stuck out like a sore thumb. It was so clearly not part of this other set of things. There are a number of people in our career that I feel like when I just just when I think of them, I feel like we never would have gotten anywhere if we hadn't met those people. I mean, um, and, and Adam is definitely like you know at the very at, at the very top of that list. Don't 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 let start. This. Don't let start was the first indie video to go into the rotation on MTV. The fact that it got onto regular rotation, I think, really was the opening shot in this kind of assault of the underground on MTV, and it eventually came to fruition in the early 90s. But uh, uh, I think They Might Be Giants were really right there at the beginning. It certainly made a, a big, huge impact on both MTV and its viewers. I think there was a big sea change at that time in music. They Might Be Giants managed to be the first band to break through that sort of wall of bad hair band videos. When MTV started playing Don't Let Start and all the videos that followed, I think people were absolutely stunned because here was a band that seemed to be coming from nowhere and had no relation to anything else that was going on musically. I have a friend who was telling me in 1987 after Don't Let's Start, he's like, wow, you know, you guys did great. I guess you have to find some real jobs now. Make a hole with a gun perpendicular to the name of this town in a desktop globe. Exit wound in a foreign nation, showing the home of the one this was written for. My apartment looks upside down from there. Water spirals the wrong way out the sink. You're the most successful independent group in the States now, aren't you? Yeah, but I mean, that's sort of like being the world's tallest midget. And the and I are getting old and we still haven't walked in the glow of each other's majestic presence. We didn't really comprehend uh, what college radio meant, and so the whole world of college radio was kind of this eye-opener. Um, the, 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 the CMJ charts and stuff like that were introduced to us, uh, or at least to me, when we were like on the top of that chart. You know, that was right. That was how we found out about it. You're number one on this thing you don't know anything about. For those who were ready to declare themselves outs in East Village, this was the occasion that would would warrant it. You know. Oh yeah, people were, yeah, I mean, it's a, the more clear it became that the Giants were, were you know, going national, I mean, the more, the more bitchy people got. Hi, it's us, They Might Be Giants, your hosts here on Postmodern MTV. Tonight, The Replacements, Public Image Limited, Agent Blue, and songs by us, They Might Be Giants. And in some ways, like, our success was very abstract to us. I mean, we were noticing that we were playing in bigger places, but, um, you know, when the major labels finally came courting, and we had really not pursued them very actively, um, it was a little bit, I don't know, it was, it was a little bit strange. I mean, I think we just didn't know, we didn't want to be messed with. 
we had another meeting that was in New York right around that same time um, with the guy at EMI, and he, he, he invites us in, and, he got, and for some reason, um, Flansburg um, couldn't make it that day, and I went with John Linnell, and he, we were ushered into this guy's office, and he goes, you know, your band is, is great. I've, I've seen your videos. They're the most witty and inventive stuff I've seen in a long time. I've seen your live show. You are the shit. I mean, and, and he turns to me and he goes, and you are a motherfucker guitarist. And I go, well, actually, I'm the manager of the band. And he's like, doesn't surprise me. Motherfucker guitarist, manager of the band. You know, I mean, you, you guys can do it all. And I, I was like, well, actually, um, John Flansburg couldn't be here today. He's like, I, I knew that. You know. uh, <laughs> When I first became interested in They Might Be Giants, I was working at Polygram Records. That was in 1986. And I really tried to get them signed to Polygram at the time. About a year later, I left Polygram for Elektra Records, and at that point it was a no-brainer. Everyone at Elektra understood what the value of They Might Be Giants was. Elektra was also home to uh, uh, the Pixies and the Sugar Cubes and people like that who also did great work at around the same time on the same label. So. Uh, you know, it wasn't outside of the realm of possibility that They Might Be Giants could also put out a great album. Why is the world in love again? Why are we marching hand in hand? Why are the ocean levels rising up? It's a brand new record for 1990. They might be giants, brand new. Hi, thanks for joining us for coffee. I'm John. And I'm John of They Might Be Giants. And we've got a new album out on Electra Records. It's called Flood. This is our rock promotion video, so come on inside. There was a period of a few months where the only thing in my car was a, this cassette copy of Flood. And to be honest, uh, like many of my favorite records, I listened to it and I did not like it. I didn't care for it. But since it was the only tape, I mean, I didn't hate it, but it just, it didn't turn me on or something, you know? But I, I only had that one cassette, so I, I would re return to it when I would come home from touring and be driving around in my car. And um, the more I listened to it, uh, something clicked one day and was like, I saw the light. And, and then I became obsessed with the record. Some records that come out today only have 10 songs or less. This makes us angry. But instead of cursing the darkness, John and I have decided to do something about it. We've put out a record with 19 songs on it. And that's why our record is better. The next part of the documentary is all about coffee. So what's it going to be, fellas? Put them on your nose? Latte? Double latte for you? No milk. Just coffee. There's, isn't there an interview now? Yeah. Okay. You want to do it? Sure. Good. I just need some coffee. I've seen them abuse it. Um, I've seen them use it recreationally and socially and professionally. I mean, it's, it's a problem. I'm the one who loves you so. so there are no filters, apparently. Videos. Okay. I've seen them hold the show for 45 minutes because the runner wasn't back from Starbucks. So that's really the most important thing. Uh, you know, if we'll, we'll do a show just about anywhere as long as there's decent coffee to be had. John did this right, and there's something wrong with the coffee maker. I don't know. What's wrong with the coffee maker? I don't, I don't know. You know. I can't figure that out. What is the problem here? Is it coming in? Well, it's going to be a good show, fellas. <laughs> Even if we didn't drink a lot of coffee, I think we could pretend that we drank coffee and still feel like that was, you know, that was. Uh, it was the right style choice. Is it not like, <laughs> this is this a pitiful, man. <laughs> I, think, I think I know. I think you know what Scotty knows for sure. Stand back. We've got, an, got a concept here. Well, the thing is, this, this thing hasn't... Ow! Wow. That's it. That's it. Right 
Once I got into a talk with him about the song Meet James Ensor, and they were completely elliptical. Like for me, like like I feel like Meet James Ensor characterizes everything I really love about the band because the song itself is so um it's like it shouldn't even be a song. Do you know what I mean? And the words are like Meet James Ensor, Belgium's famous painter, dig him up and shake him his hand, appreciate the man. And then like our, like every part of that is already so funny and like wrong headed for a song. And then, um, and then the words of the first verse are like before there were artists, before there was before there was junk stores, before there was junk, which is already like so like lovely and well stated. Um, he lived in a something, you know, he lived in a garret. I can't remember like exactly how it goes. And so, like at one point, like I like I like you know, I was talking to them. I was like, okay, I'm like a fan of this band, and like this never ever happens that you get to ask somebody like, so like like wh- why is this like why does it start this way and like what are you guys thinking that you would even put that into a song, and um. And all I could get out of him was like, no, he is a really great painter. <laughs> like that was it. Like no, no, we did, like, we didn't think that that was a weird subject for a song. He's a really good painter. When we try and interpret them ourselves, sometimes we have to do an interview where we're, you know, they say, well, what's what's the song all about? And I thought I never thought about what what the song's about, you know. And then we try and come up with some explanation for it, and you know, I think it makes the song seem really foreign. Well, like what I wanted to know is okay. All right, you get up in the morning, you have your coffee, and all right, we've got, we've got to write some songs for the record today. What do we write about? <laughs> like, that, that was the thing that came to somebody's mind? Like, that that was the decision? That's completely contrary to all good sense. Triangle Man, Triangle Man, Triangle Man hates Particle Man. They have a fight, Triangle wins, Triangle Man. I really feel like a lot of the times people get everything about it and the things that they think that they don't get don't exist you know what i mean that there's nothing there's nothing missing in their understanding of particle man it's clearly about physics particle man might think no one cares about him triangle man might think you know but feel tough you know sharp edges i believe that this song is about life and all the different perspectives that people have it could be talking about the universe you know ever ever consider that I don't believe it really has a lot to do with physics. Is the glass half empty or is the glass half full? Does water get him or does he get water? I think that's less physical than you make it out to be. Universe man, universe man, size of the entire universe man, usually kind of smaller man, universe man. We felt very strongly that they need to get a band um, right after flood. And I think our natural response was, you know, just you know, leave us alone, because like, what do you know? What do you know about how to be a success in rock? You know, here we are, you know, barely successful at all. I encouraged them to do it because I thought that they had really come as far as they were going to come in their stage show using the tape. We came up with Person Man, degraded man, Person Man. Some of the hardcores actually established a boycott. I mean, for the first year of the band, there were. We go to gigs and there would be people outside with leaflets saying, don't go to the show. You know, they, they have a band. I think that they, there was something lost when they went from doing the tape show to the band. I think there, there was a feeling among us that were there in the early days that it was uh, a bit of a betrayal of what we'd come to know and love. When the duo became a band, I loved it. The live shows are just, I find, 20 times better. And they, they were good before, but I, I like the full band sound. They have a fight, triangle wins, triangle man. This is the story. We're playing at the Majeska Theater in Milwaukee. And I remember the fire marshal in Milwaukee was very, and always is, very strict. And they had people in the aisles, ushers, and they were doing their damnedest to keep people in their seats. They were not letting them stand up. They were not letting them in the aisle. And this was frustrating the hell out of the band. About half, three quarters of the way through the show, I 
I decide that that's the point where no matter what happens, it'll be fine if people keep on dancing. They're not gonna, there's not enough of the show left that if people dance from this point on, if they shut us down, it'll be a big deal. And I don't think they're even gonna shut us down. So I get on the mic and I go, I don't think that the fire marshal would mind if you people came down and danced thinking, you know, they'll dance in the aisles. And of course, people started flooding and dancing into the aisles. And then about 75 people or so, I think, uh, actually danced down the aisles and moved right onto the stage. And so they're all dancing on top of the, th on top of the thrust in, in the spotlight. And I'm just seeing, I'm just seeing this, these revelers in silhouette just kind of doing this crazy, you know, crazy polka. We're playing really loud and there's this huge <laughs> cracking, smashing, breaking noise and there's dust and filth and just stuff everywhere, like the ultimate, you know, David Copperfield reveal. And then as, you know, the dust kind of goes away, I, I, I just see these like huge planks of stuff with nails coming out of them and all the people are gone. And then I, I look down and all the people who are dancing in front of us are like a story below us in where the orchestra pit was, just kind of, you know, feet coming out, the whole thing. And I'm just thinking, this is, this is where my career ends. Flansburg grabbed yeah. these t-shirts. I think he jumped in a cab. I don't even remember how he got there. Found out what hospital. Uh, we knew that there weren't any real major injuries. When I told one of the guys that we had actually gone back on stage, he, he was like, no, dude, you can't tell me you played more and I knew it was, you know, he was completely like angry that he hadn't seen the rest of the show. So, you know, we send him to the hospital and they still, they still want more. You know, it's very flattering. It seems that the fans are always the same age. You know, five years later, we show up at a venue and they're, they're young rather than being my age. <laughs> they, you know, the people that heard them when they were in I high school. They, yeah, <laughs> people that heard them when they were in high school, some of those people are still fans, but their, their whole fan base didn't grow older with them. I mean, I think the reason why they get like an audience that, whose age seems to start at like 12 to 14 is that there's a cleverness to the songs that just kills you when you're that age. You just can't believe like that it could be so clever. They have a very strong following, a very rabid following that enjoys the quirkiness, the, um, the intellectual side of their music. I've seen them probably over 20 times and I was actually going to see them in their London show, but I couldn't get my passport in time. My first They Might Be Giants show was nine years ago and since then I've been to 77 more shows. Uh, I met my fiance at They Might Be Giants show in Rhode Island, actually, and we got engaged at the They Might Be, they Might Be Giants show last summer in Brooklyn. So it, uh, the van has a really special meaning for both of us. Uh, I came here from Detroit, and uh, a lot of people gave me a lot of kind of sideways glances because that's pretty far away. But uh, having spent the last like six or seven hours in line, uh, I started to realize that They Might Be Giants fans are some of the scariest people I've ever met in my life. And uh, there's a guy out there who shaved his ankle. Okay, so he wants John Flansburg to sign his ankle and then he's gonna go the next day to get it tattooed. Um, I just think that's kind of weird. Did you take a picture of the, the cupcakes that spelled out they might be giant? It's and do you know who, who made them for you? Some fan. It was Amy, Bethany, is that Tamara or Samara? Claire. We love you that's more than fudge. Samurai. Oh, we that's love why you, you we love you more than fudge. <laughs> yeah, that's what it says. <laughs> we love you more than fudge. That's why you get fudge. That's a I'm kind of, not. I. It's kind of dream logic. I'm not eating any of that stuff. What's your name? Scott. Scott. Um, two teas. I love them so much. I no idea. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> Have you met them before? <laughs> like very briefly, but I've never like talked to them. I've just like shook, shook their hands. <laughs> oh my god, it's like the greatest day ever. <laughs>
James loved politics, and so did Sarah. They both enjoyed being at the center of the young nation's political life. When he ran for governor, she remained in Columbia and tracked the political opposition and their doings. Columbia, April 11, 1843. Dear husband, all my fears are you cannot stand the hard labor of the canvas. I am not patriotic enough to make sacrifices for my country. I love myself, I mean my husband, better or more than my country. You have rather tantalized me in making appointments so near to home and yet giving me no opportunity of seeing you. Sarah Polk. When he ran for president, he did so from their front porch, and she loved having him at home and enjoying with him the excitement of the contest. It was a closely run thing in 1844. In 1844, the Democrats were split. Three nominees for the presidential candidate were Martin Van Buren, former president and an abolitionist. James Buchanan, a moderate. Louis Cass, a general and expansionist. Severe, he held few people dear. His oratory filled his foes with fear. Factions soon agreed, just the man we need to bring about victory. Fulfill our manifest destiny. And the next, the land, the Mexican. One of the most difficult things that can happen to an A&R person is to be offered another opportunity at another label. And that happened to me in uh, 1992. And when Sue left, it was kind of the beginning, I mean, it was essentially the beginning of the end for us there because we're not a band that everybody gets, and we're certainly not a band that everybody at record companies get. After Sue Drew left Electra, Bob Krasnow himself, the president of the label, had appointed themselves, they might be Giants A&R person, um, which seemed like a good thing, except then he got fired th two weeks before our album came out, and um, we, we went from having him as our A&R person to the most junior staff member there, um, who wasn't even particularly a fan. And, you know, we, it, it was a very graphic representation of where our stock and the company stood. Of course, around, you know, late 91, there was the whole, you know, alternative rock revolution, and you had these, you know, really, you know, grungy, uh, loud bands uh, taking over the, the record industry and there didn't seem to be a place for a, a band like They Might Be Giants and uh, 
at around the same time, there was a whole new regime coming in at Electra who uh, not only didn't understand uh, they might be giants, they kind of barely even understood the whole alternative rock thing. So, um, you know, bands like They Might Be Giants and Frank Black and people like that were really stranded. Watching what happened to They Might Be Giants on Electra while I was working at another label was one of the most painful things I could experience. Because here you see a band that, you know, has only the truest of intentions and, and wanting to make the best possible records that they could make and please their fans, and yet they were delivering records to a company that A, had no idea what they were about, and B, didn't have any idea how to promote them. I was pleased to see that they continued with the live band, that they still continued to tour, and, and that they were, uh, they were going to be a musical concern no matter what label they were signed to, no matter what happened in their career and, and with their record sales. But I always felt that they, they deserved more. We went to Japan, I'm thinking in 96. We had like one day in Tokyo. We had a travel day to Tokyo with that night off, and then we had a show in Tokyo, and we were out of there the next day. And the band and the Johns and everybody wanted a chance to hang out in Tokyo a little bit. So the label comes to us and says, how about doing a a you know a live coffee house type performance you know when you get into town and the John said no no we don't want to do that we're going to be really busy we want we want some hang time I think a couple days went by and we got another call saying we really like you to do this and the John said no we're not going to do it we've promised our band they're going to get to see Tokyo they're going to get to hang out a little bit so I think no was said three or four times and as it would go up the ladder the Johns would just say no you know please listen and oh we get to Tokyo, we run a bullet train, and we get off the bullet train, and there on the platform is the label rep ready to take us to the coffee house performance. Bless their hearts, they stood there on the platform and said, this is really uncomfortable for us, we, you know, we don't like this position, we're not gonna do it. And they didn't do it. And I, that was pretty much at the end of the relationship with Electra, and you know maybe that was the final nail. But I, I really think at the time that the Giants were so happy to move on, also because they they weren't getting the attention at all, and the communication was horrible, and it, it culminated there on a on a platform in Japan. I can see myself at the end of the tour, when the road disappears. If there's any more people around when the tour runs aground. And if you're still around, then we'll meet at the end of the tour. The engagements are booked through the end of the world, so we'll meet at the end of the tour. Never to part. Since the day we met out on Interstate 91, I was bent metal, you were a flaming wreck. When we kissed at the overpass, I was sailing along with the people, driving themselves to distraction inside me. Then came a knock on the door, which was odd and the picture abruptly changed. At the end of the tour, when the road disappears, if there's any more people around when the tour runs aground, and if you're still around, then we'll meet at the end of the tour. The engagements are booked through the end of the world, so we'll meet at the end of the tour. This was the vehicle. These were the people. You opened the door and expelled all the people. This was the vehicle. These were the people. You let them go. The end of the tour. When the road disappears. If there's any more people around when the tour runs aground, and if you're still around, then we'll meet at the end of the tour. The engagements are booked through the end of the world, so we'll meet at the end of the tour. And we're never going to tour again. No, we're never going to tour again. Even old New York was once New Amsterdam. Why they change it, I can't say. People just liked it better that way. So take me back to Constantinople. No, you can't go back to Constantinople. Been a long time gone to Constantinople. Why did Constantinople get the worst? That's nobody's business but the Turks.
was like the showbiz guy. He's the super, he's got a bit of vaudevillian in him. That's what I always thought. He is very kind of vaudeville slash burlesque. And he really is Mr. Showbiz, you know? Whereas Linnell, kind of more, uh, he reminds me of Emily Dickinson in a lot of ways. And I always thought, you know, that was almost cheating that they're both named John in the end. Um, that there are these two different personalities. Because um, from a metaphorical standpoint, it's it's very um, appealing to me that there's uh, there's the extrovert John and the, and the introvert John. And John Flansburg is uh, the extrovert, you know, he's the real showman, the rocker, the guitar player, the, the impresario. Flansburg is both half of the band and he's Colonel Parker. Like, he's the one calling the factory at midnight to be sure the things will be shipped to Newark at, you know, 7 in the morning so the trucks can get them out to stores. And, you know, also, like, negotiating the contract with the TV network. You know, like, you get the feeling that, like, that's what Flansburg's doing. Flansburg, you know, just, his, he has a, you know, 31-hour day. So he's, he's just doing more stuff, you know, than anybody on the planet, I think. He could be the president of the United States. He could be the president of a record company, you know. Uh, the, the problem would be, like, I think President of the United States would, you know, I mean, he'd have enough things to keep him busy. Uh, but if he was the president of a record company, he'd probably have something going on the side. John Flansburg is sort of like the mouthpiece for the band. He does the set lists. He's uh, more involved with the artistic element of the show. This is Don't Into Spy, Into Cyclops, Into Minimum. So it's like a total sled ride. We're on the bus and there's not enough Mountain Dews and one of the guys doesn't drink any other soft drink. Flans will stop the bus in the middle of the night, jump off the bus, go to the Quickie Mart, and buy a six-pack of Mountain Dew to make sure that person's happy. That's well, a, you know. Well, what people don't realize is he's actually scoring dope. <laughs> That's really what the, you know, but, the Mountain Dew is the front. <laughs> George, please. <laughs> don't, don't get all up to that with me. You tell me what's best. This is, the, this, is, this is what I'm suggesting. It's verse, chorus, verse, chorus, keyboard solo, and then, you know, in the, in the holes, and then what do we do after that? Flansburg is a very outgoing and strong personality, and Linnell would much, I think, rather be writing songs. I think it suits him to, to defer to Flansburg in terms of being the sort of the, 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 the public voice. If Linnell weren't in a band, he would still be writing as many songs, but, like, nobody would ever hear them. He would just be in his basement just, like, making songs. Like, he's dr just driven to make songs. You know, there's like a whole category of, of people who um, who have an extroverted side where they want to perform, but are actually deeply shy. It's like a very special kind of performer. I think that gives like his presence on stage a special quality because you you can tell that that maybe he'd really just as soon be home. Those are eyeballs. Those are eyeballs. Yeah. We had those. We did. You have them in your head. Your eye. You know, it's going to be more difficult in a few days when we go out on the road. And I'm seeing Henry only once uh, every every three weeks. You know, up until about Christmas time. It took up every bit of our time. And I we, see. Um, we, um, you know, we did we couldn't write songs or make records or do any of that stuff. When you know Linnell and you hear him sing a song on one of his records, you laugh even harder or that much more like fascinated by it because you know him and you go like, you know, it's like, it's, you know, it really, it isn't just like, oh, he's just doing his, his little thing that he does, you know what I mean? And, um, oh, isn't that nice? It's really like, oh my gosh, it's like that guy that I met, that guy that I know in this weird song I'm listening to, they, they are one. I think Linnell, it almost seems like he genetically has this melody gene or something that has allows him to write these incredible cascading melodies that uh, just stick in your cranium. And he's got like this gorgeous, perfect lyric. It's like one, you know, an afternoon. The one that really got to me was um, I asked him to write a song about a sneeze, uh, someone who was cleaning a vehicle that was going to go to the moon, sneeze, 
and a little germ, we quickly washed it all off, but one germ stuck in the machine. That germ traveled to the moon, was bombarded by solar radiation, and somehow survived. I said to him, John, make me a ballad of the lonely germ. This would have taken me two weeks to sort of come. He did it, as best I can tell, between lunch and dinner. Now that's not right. John is a musical genius. John is like the biggest, you know, musical influence I've ever had. You know, um, he's introduced me to a whole lot of, of really interesting ideas, and uh, I don't think I'd be the kind of songwriter that I am if I hadn't worked with him. You know, it's like we work together on some songs and then we write songs separately. I think it's a healthy competition. Speaking as somebody who is just, you know, I'm not a virtuoso. Uh, 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 performer and I'm not like I don't have a lot of music theory background so I mean be working with John you know, um, you know just kicks my ass so hard all the time to try to sort of write to his level. I always thought of him as being the guy in the back room you know with the tools you know putting this stuff together and Flansburg was the salesman who was out there you know selling it. I'm very flattered by that by that idea but I think that um I think that, 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 you know, the horrible truth is that I, I always felt in my relationship to Flans like he had this kind of special, you know, I, I hate the word genius, but I think that he's like one of these people who gets, who gets these, uh, the kind of inspirations that I always feel jealous of. John really is an original thinker, you know, uh, and I'm not, Trying, and this is not false modesty. I really, I really think that John is a kind of a more rare commodity in a way, which is to say he's disinterested in, in tradition if it um, runs up against something that's more attractive to him. I'm not just respectful of it. I'm really kind of envious of it. I think, I think that's a great, uh, a great gift, you know. So in some ways, I think that um, I hope John never finds out. Really, I guess he'll see this film eventually, and then he'll know. But, but uh, I, I sort of feel like he could do it all by himself, and he'd have a very, very good franchise on his own. Um, but uh, I, I sort of need him to believe that I am somehow essential to this project. If I were playing that, what would I do? <laughs> You're probably wondering if there was sex exchanged. Oh, not yet. No. Were you leading up to that? No, no, no. Oh, this isn't, okay, this isn't like a Penny Baker documentary. This is, is this more like a fluff piece? Well, I want to make sure that I come across as the Mike Love of the Much <laughs> in this documentary. I want to make it clear. Yeah, right. The bad vibes start here. Yeah. I think that they had tons of sex, but... I can't really confirm or deny that, and it wasn't with me. I'll tell you what's feeling weird right now. We're being videoed, and I'm talking about the thing what Donna talks about in that stupid... My monitors are just going in and out. I can't hear myself at all. You know that! Because their parents are alive, right? And they're going to see this, right? Okay. Did you shoot me asleep? Yes, I did. You did not. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize this was uh, the disco now. Cocksucker blues. While the band sound checked one day in Florida, I went to a little thrift store next door and I bought a three dollar platinum blonde wig. A really cheap ass wig. I found it interesting that all of a sudden they were kind of lining up, going, Hey, you coming to the show tonight? Would you like to be on the list? Hey, wow. I was like, Yeah, I'd love to come to the show. You have to imagine, wait, don't imagine, wait. 
So it was more like, you know, blonde, and you know, like, just, you know. Well, okay, now I'm a little Joey Ramon, which is cool, but I don't know if it would have the same effect, but picture it blonde and more attractive. All I'm saying is, guys, <laughs> my word, <laughs> don't be so cheap and easy. We like a challenge, too. <laughs> What was the question? A lot of things became possible for us after we weren't constrained by our strict major label record deal. I guess there was also the further realization that we, you know, the Giants had to, had to get to work if they were going to you know, keep the project alive. There was a ton of press about what digital music was going to do and what the numbers were going to be like. And, how was cannibalizing record sales and retail was going to freak out and record companies were clinging to secure formats and all of that sort of stuff. And eMusic was sort of in the back seat going, we have something here. It's just a question of, you know, will it resonate with the people? And the Giants came to eMusic, basically said, we have a piece of work that's pretty much finished. Um, we're going to call it Long Tall Weekend that we'd like to distribute exclusively through eMusic. Um, online, no one's ever really done that before, and as a result, they are the highest selling um, band on the internet. They worked on our radio show with us, and um, they just did that collaboration with McSweeney's, the um, journal, I guess we're supposed to call it. Please recognize our notable namesake, Timothy McSweeney's The Journal of Pro and Music. It's bizarre to be in a position where you can email them and hope to work with them or something and it works out. Um, I just feel it, it doesn't make any sense, you know, but it's, um, I'll take it. Why is it taking so long for you to come out with a new album? We've been doing all this soundtrack work and incidental music work, so we've been pretty busy. Evil, evil is his one and only name. <laughs> haven't been around for so long and successful for so long, uh, their fans wouldn't have, you know, come into positions of power. There are a lot of people in the creative community who've, like, really come forward and made their interest in what we do known and, and incorporated our music into their projects and we feel old. Yeah, I mean, actually. we're sort of, re we're reaching the, you know, the Mark Twain's late period when he was the plaything right. of the rich. Yes, no, maybe, I don't know. go to these guys' uh, concerts and you buy their records and then all of a sudden you're on the phone with them and they're going like, uh, well, do you have any notes on this song? Any adjustments you would like to make? And, uh, you know, I'm on the phone going like, I can't believe I'm on the phone with you, please work. Roaches survived five extinctions before. I guess they are good, but I don't know what for. Dandelions can adapt and renew. Seems like they grow best right under my shoe. We've got some terrific questions. Plenty of questions on the road to a brave new world. This is The Daily Show with John Stewart, the most important television program ever. Here's what Robin was saying. Here was my idea. Robin was saying how, like, Mock in the Middle has, like, brought in like jocks into the fold as well. <laughs> so like talking about the nerd jock paradigm shift. That wow. Your that's, that's, uh, well, yeah. Yeah. we had to we can clarify roll with that. to Robin that we weren't talking about you guys as nerds, more about the fans and she got very defensive. And then we're like, no, we don't mean that. Friends. They're our friends. We mean <laughs> Well, you don't know how sensitive we are. Yes, we do. We no, no, no. Some sort of yeah. Right, right. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah, you know how it is. You know how it is. I was a bartender in City Gardens, was, let's be frank, uh, uh, a hole. You were expert at uh, opening beers. We noticed that right away. Thank you. Thank you very but, much. Um, You're one of my top jobs as bartender. Well, I don't know if you people are aware of uh, Camden, New Jersey, but basically it's like, uh, it's Trenton. about. Uh, Trenton. Trenton. No, it's, in it's Cam like Camden. Right. Similar. Right. Which is about so let, let four miles see, like, from the, the gates of, the of hell. Right. Right. The vibe of the band basically is you talk a lot till you make a mistake. I'm the fact checker. <laughs> then right. he comes right. in and right. goes, Oh, right. That's not right. <laughs> right. He's sort of the Lennon. 
Yeah, uh... You're the McCarthy. He's the Trotsky. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a it's a sort of a Lennon McCartney dynamic, and uh, uh, I won't say who's Lennon and who's McCartney. People are gonna know that we've heard of the Beatles when they see this in the movie. <laughs> we might be losing some credibility right. with our audience for not having just done things like yeah, the Beatles. Made it up, yeah. They find out we've actually heard heard Beatles records. They're gonna feel differently about us. We are the shitty Beatles. <laughs> and they'll tell that they, they love each other, they look at each other as friends. They're not going to break up the way most teams do break up at the peak of their fame. They want to go their separate ways. They don't get on each other's nerves, and uh, they're both beautiful people. It's a f true friendship, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a marriage of sorts. We managed to spend a crazy amount of time together without actually getting resentful about it. What is the price of fame that, that, that uh, uh, Flansburg, Illinois, they might be giants, have, have paid? Well, we have to smell each other for months on end on a, on a tiny bus. Now, is this a ritual? It's, it's involuntary. It's involuntary. This, right. is, this is based on the close quarters yeah, you're just, in. You know, we're, we're yeah. about to hit the road. We're going to be in a, in a really tiny bus with a bunch of other guys. And uh, that's what we have to look forward to. That now, is, see, other the bands, uh, the Village People, for instance, look forward right. to that experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, we were, doing, we were doing an interview once, and I, I was sitting next to John, and he, and he was saying, like, yeah, we've got to spend a lot of time together. You know, it's, it's really hard on a relationship. I mean, we respect each other, but, you know, it gets to a point where you just resent the way the other guy breathes. <laughs> and I'm thinking... And this was news to John. Yeah, and I'm thinking, he resents the way I breathe? Right. Yeah, that's, that's I don't, not fair. I don't resent the way he breathes. Right. <laughs> right. well, we've been stuck together so much that it's really kind of unfair on our relationship. I think it's it's unfortunate because we can't really socialize in, in the way that, like, you know, people who are just, you know, who are just friends do. There's a thing about your oldest friends, too, that they, they I'm sure you know, that they, they, they make you laugh in a way that you feel like nobody else has that direct line on on your sensibility. One of the first things we had to, ah, sorry. One of the, one of the first things we had to, ah! <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Bring them in, bring them in. John and John will never have the problem of almost being nothing. Their somethingness is rock solid. But it is America. And in America, the only way you're truly validated is if the entire country at some point stands up and says, we love you. So of course you want that. But in their case, I bet they've got the solid place. You know, sometimes it must seem a little frustrating, but, I, but they've got it. And you can see in their eyes that they know they've got it. Not in their fans' eyes, in their eyes. I think it all comes back down to the Cold War, has like so many things, you know? I mean, I think if you're a sensitive and smart person uh, growing up, say, in the 70s and 80s in this country, then there's a certain kind of humor that appeals to you that has a sort of absurdist slant, where there are these um, smart people who have um, curious takes on a curious America, and um, who are funny, but not, um, not, but in a new way, um, kind of like how Letterman wasn't comedy, capital C, you know, it wasn't jokes about airplanes or something. It was about not taking the world for granted. The thing I love about They Might Be Giants is that they don't take the world for granted. You called me last night on the telephone, and I was glad to hear from you because I was all alone. You said it's snowing, it's snowing, God I hate this weather. Streets are paved with diamonds and
the center. Wish I was there. We do a lot of shows with a lot of other bands, and so we get, I kind of feel like we have an inside view to some extent of what it's like in the rock world. And I think what, in a lot of ways, separates uh, the Giants from my experience with a lot of other people is that everybody involved in it is kind of as you see them. They've always been very original. They've always kind of done their own thing. And I think that that, that sets them apart from a lot of uh, other bands, a lot of other trends, and, and, uh, and has given them longevity. And I think that that, that shows people that you can be yourself and be in a band and your band can do well. So it's just a nice lesson about, you know, because there's an awful lot of people in, with talent. There really are. But, but most people just give up because, because of, you know, the disappointments that hit everybody. And they, they had that persistence. I always wondered, where does the name They Might Be Giants come from? Why not? We are giants, damn it. We were huge. I think that um, the, the, the sort of the sphere that we inhabit is visible to everyone except for us, you know. I think that that's a thing about, um, also a thing about the way we view it, you know, that we, we prefer not to, like, objectify they might be giants. It, it's, it's totally, uh, it's got to be a, a world of unlimited potential for us. It can't have a style or an idea preset to well, it. Well, it's interesting. You know? Well, because it's like the idea of it being a musical universe, you would think like it's a musical universe starring us, but for us, it's like a musical universe starring it, otherness. It's the, it's the it's, musical it's, it's, universe. Yeah, it's the, know? and it's kind of, I mean, in a way, you know, our, even the way we thought the name was kind of interesting is, right. and is so different than the popular interpretation of what makes the name interesting because for us, they might be giants was obviously, you know, just as a set of words, was this outward looking thing, you know, that it was like, you know, some guy sitting in his, looking out the window, looking out at the world. And it was like about that stuff going on out there that you might not be able to understand. Like what, what they do in their band is so particular, it's such a particular aesthetic. Like the thought has occurred to me a lot. Like what a shame that those two guys are in They Might Be Giants because if they weren't in They Might Be Giants and they would stumble on the record, they'd just love it. You know, <laughs> like, like, like it's such a like a particular aesthetic that like that like if they happen to stumble on it, like somebody else doing it, they would just think like, oh my goodness, you know, <laughs> and like and how sad for them that they're actually in the band, and so for them to hear that sound, they actually have to make it themselves, you know, that they can't have the pleasure of it that the rest of us get of thinking like, oh wow, wow, they're shooting for that, like that's that's what they're doing. Like, it's sort of like, if you think about it, kind of sad for the two of them. I met someone at the dog show. She was holding my left arm. But everyone was acting normal, so I tried to look nonchalant. We both said, I really love you. The Shriners loaned us cars. We raced up and down the sidewalk 20,000 million times. Why did they send her over anyone else? How should I react? These things happen to other people. They don't happen at all. In fact, when you're following an angel, does it mean you have to throw your body off? gonna ask for my admission I'm gonna speak to the man in charge the secretary says he's on another line can I hold for a long long time I found out she's an angel I don't think she knows I know I'm worried that something might happen to me if anyone ever finds out why Thing. 
Spaceship, the silver spaceship, the lion waves goodbye. 